The Ten Commandments were not meant to enslave us, but they were meant to enrich us and help us to live what the really good life is all about. And so we looked at last week what it meant to say that God alone was who we were going to worship. And today we want to look at a kind of a, a passage that you might think we really don't have a problem with, and that is the passage about idolatry. Now, I think especially for those who maybe haven't grown up in church or you maybe recently come to faith in Christ or maybe you're just curious and you're looking into the faith and maybe you're looking for some answers, you go, it's kind of hard to accept something ancient like the Bible or especially ancient like the Ten Commandments as a, as a rule for my life, as, as the boundary, as hemming me in for my life. I mean, even my college textbooks can't be more than four years old before they have to be discarded because knowledge is increasing that rapidly and that quickly. So how can we depend upon something like the Word of God to be the the rule, the guideline, the, the boundaries for our life to be truth? Well, I think there's a real simple answer to that. It, it does take faith, but it's, it's the faith that the God who gave us his word, that nothing in God's word has ever been disproved, nothing in God's word is ever found to be faulty, and those who have built and based their lives upon the word, it's like Jesus says, you're building your house upon a rock, and when the storms of life come, they will not fall. Now, a few years ago, and um, I thought it was a very interesting article on CNN, that um, they ask a group of people around the world, CNN has this global outreach for their news outlet, they ask a group of people, they, if you're an atheist, would you come up with the Ten Commandments? And they had a team of scholars that were going to select what they thought were the best of the Ten Commandments. And so all of these people from around the world This was the way they were supposed to think. Instead of asking God for a rule of faith for our life, what would it have been like if Moses had asked the Israelites for a rule of faith for their life? So think about asking your fellow peers, the people you know, your neighbors, what would be a rule of life? And they came up with Ten Commandments that this team of scholars that were part of this thought were the very best of the Ten Commandments out of Tens of thousands of of submissions that came in for Ten Commandments. Everybody had their own idea. But there was interesting, there were no thou shalt nots. There was no prohibition against adultery. There was no prohibition against murder. There was none of that. But I thought maybe I'd just share with you real quickly what the world came up with as Ten Commandments. Be open-minded. Be willing to alter your belief with new evidence. Number two. Strive to understand what is most likely to be true, not what you wish to be true. Number three, the scientific method is the most reliable way of understanding the natural world. How many times do we hear that in the last election campaign? Every person has the right to control of their body. God is not necessary to be a good person or to live a full and meaningful life. Be mindful of the consequences of all your actions and recognize that you must take responsibility for them. This one came close to what Jesus taught us in the Golden Rule. Treat others as you would want them to treat you and can reasonably expect them to want to be treated. Think about their perspective. We have the responsibility to consider others, including future generations, Number nine, there's no right way to live. And then number 10, this sounds like the Boy Scouts, leave the world a better place than you found it. And that was the world's idea. You could think of a Silicon Valley, of the most intelligent group of people coming around. And basically, it's a world without boundaries. It's a world without us being hemmed in, thinking that we can find freedom thinking that we can find liberty somewhere in that. The book of 1 John, and and the book of 1 John is as fascinating, if you've never read it, it's just a very small epistle, it won't take you but a few minutes to read it, but it's about loving one another, it's about loving God, and it just goes on and on about God's love for us and how we should love one another. But very interestingly, the very last verse of the Bible Very affectionately, the Apostle John says to his congregation, he says, Dear children, keep yourself 
from idols. And I challenge you this afternoon, go home and read that book and then just go, wow, what an ending to such a book of love and a message of love and loving God. And, and then Pastor John wants to conclude by saying to us, dear children, there's a fatherly sense there, there's a pastoral sense there, there's an affectionate sense there, where he closes by saying, keep yourself from idols. I once heard a preacher say, human beings are little idol-making factories. Human beings are little idol-making factories. And after a long, long period of being in ministry and living life, I found that to be true. At first, I was like, that's such a negative statement, but I found it to be true even in my own life. In a few weeks, we'll be coming upon our 40 days of fasting and prayer during the season of Lent. And it's amazing to me how every year the Holy Spirit puts his finger on something that I'm in danger of making an idol out of that I'm in danger of putting more attention on that than I am on God, more attention on that than I am on my family, my ministry. It's like we have this propensity in this world of sin that we live in and we battle against that we make idols. We can make idols of our spouses. We can make idols of our families. How many have you ever heard someone say when they're in love, I just worship the ground they walk on? Now, I understand what they're saying. They don't believe they're God. Get married and you'll find out pretty quick they're not God's. But here's the deal. You really do sense that much love and it's about the only way you know how to express yourself. But you know from last week, we worship only God. So if you would, stand up with me this morning. Let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 20 and verse 4. And we're going to start with the second commandment this morning. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now, let me stop right there. When God says jealous, he's not talking about the sinful jealousy that people can have. In my ministry, I have discovered and working with people, the faithful spouse is the one that is most wounded by the unfaithful spouse. Let me say it again. The faithful spouse, the one who loves her spouse, is the one that's most wounded and takes so much time. The spouse that's been unfaithful wants to forget it, wants to put it back. It says, I like it never happened, but the faithful spouse, because of their love and their jealousy for them, there's this deep hurt and pain. And so when God talks about jealous God, it's like, I'm jealous for Becky's love and affections. I'm not insecure. She's not insecure about me. As a matter of fact, one of the things we talked about when we got married is because ministry requires my spending so much time sometimes with a, alone with another woman or her spending time alone with another man that we couldn't afford to be jealous or insecure. We, we wanted to keep boundaries around our lives. So I don't go out to dinner with a woman by myself. I don't ride in a car with a woman by myself if it's not Becky or my daughter. D does that make sense to you? So when you see jealous, this is not like a sinful jealousy. This is God's love. Let's pick up with the next sentence then. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who re reject me. Now, this is not about generational curses. This is not about hexes. This is not about God saying to a, a righteous son or a daughter, tough luck, kid, your daddy was a bad, bad boy, and I'm going to punish you too. That's not what this is saying. Ezekiel makes that clear that the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The person who shares the sins of their parents will share the judgment of their parents. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying here. The person who, who maybe was raised to love evil and, 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 and rebelled against God... That's why church is so important. That's why having your family in church. That's why having family devotions are so important. The next verse, God says, I will lavish my love to a thousand generations upon those that love me. The way you're living now, by keeping your lives free from idols and loving God and serving God, 
you're calling down blessings upon your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and all the generations to follow. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise for that? Isn't that amazing? Just an amazing story. Well, let's pray. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for the wisdom of your word. I pray that right now for everyone that may be thinking, why should this have anything to do with my life? I don't have an idol. Or why should this have anything to do with my life? This is such an ancient book. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to the truth, the beauty of your word, the power of your word, but above all, Lord, open our eyes to Jesus, his work upon the cross, his resurrection from the grave, and his salvation that he offers to all who believe. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this morning. I hope that kind of makes clear some things that people sometimes get confused about when they read this commandment or when they read about God's jealousy or the sins of generations. It's not about a generational curse. The reason I brought that up is somebody this week on a phone call asked me about that. And I thought, wow, this is a perfect time to address that. And I know there's some teaching out there, but never forget verse 6. God says he lavishes his love. The very next verse, and I perhaps should have put that in there, but you go home and read verse 6 of of that chapter, and you'll see God lavishes his love upon a thousand generations. Well, let's talk about this whole deal of idolatry for just a moment. Look with me at Deuteronomy 4 and verse 15. When the Lord spoke to you, now in your outline, if it's in there, circle that word spoke. That's an important word. When the Lord spoke to you from the fire on Mount Sinai, you did not see any form. Circle the word see. That's another important word we'll get to. For your own good. Circle that phrase. For your own good. That's an important phrase right there. So the word spoke, the word see, And now that phrase, for your own good. For your own good, then make certain you do not sin by making for yourself an idol in any form at all, whether man or woman, animal or bird, reptile or fish. Do not be tempted to worship and serve what you see in the sky, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The Lord your God has given these to all other peoples for them to worship. I want you to notice the contrast in that passage of Scripture between the dominion mandate in Genesis 1, where human beings are required to be stewards. Remember, we talked about stewards in our offering this morning. Where human beings are required to be stewards of the creation. God says, take dominion. That doesn't mean to rape the planet. That doesn't mean we can do anything we want to do with that word dominion. Literally means steward the planet. And there, we were created as the apex of God's creation. God spoke everything else into existence. God created us, breathed into us the breath of life, and now said, steward the animals, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the land, the atmosphere. Be good stewards of that. And when human beings sinned and shut themselves off from God, then suddenly... Instead of stewarding or taking dominion over creation, human beings began to worship creation. They began to make deities out of the stars and the skies. They began to worship the animals. Remember the golden calf that the children of Israel created and and said, these are your gods. They began to worship serpents. And we see this still happening in our world today, even in some places in America, the sort of idolatry that you would think about. Verse 19 doesn't mean that God created these for people to worship. Verse 19 simply means what Jesus meant. God makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. The stars and the moon and the changing of seasons that could be predicted by the patterns in the sky, by the patterns of the stars, by the migration of the animals, it helped the ancient peoples to know how to farm, how to practice agriculture, maybe how to migrate for those who lived nomadic lifestyles and hadn't settled down yet. It's why God says he makes the sun and the rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. God was recognizing here the rhythms of creation that he had created 
But what people did is they made gods out of these things and said, these are your gods. One time, one of the prophets spoke about this. He says, he's just, just describing the stupidity, if I can use that word. I know it's an insulting word. It's a harsh word, but the stupidity of idol making. He said, why is it that you would take a piece of wood? And I thought about this while I was splitting some firewood this week. You will take a piece of wood, you will split some firewood, and then you'll take a piece of the firewood you split, and you'll fashion yourself an idol out of it. You'll heat yourself with the fire, you'll cook with the fire, and then you'll bow down and say, this is my God, this is my God. And I picked up a little log, and I thought, what a stupid way to live. And yet, that's what happens when we shut God out of our lives We were created to worship, to have fellowship with God. And so we try to fill that with something, as that preacher said years ago, and we create and become a little idol-making factory. Matter of fact, idolatry was so huge and such a problem. Notice this next passage from Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Paul is going to Athens, and there are idols everywhere. Everywhere you look, there are idols And while Paul, look at verse 16 with me, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. I love the King James Version, that verse for this. He was vexed in his spirit. There was something that deeply troubled him about the idolatry that surrounded him. And having walked through ancient many cities in ancient Greece and looked at those temples and saw the idols and walked through in other cultures where people were bowing down and bringing offerings to idols and watched them as do that. I I remember standing in one temple watching as people were bowing and pleading and interceding like sometimes we do in our own altar at the church to this stone statue and just wanting to cry out to them, there is a real God, a true God that you didn't <coughs> fashion with your hands who loves you and who can break this bondage in your life. False gods destroy us. False gods devour our lives. They devour our resources. They keep us from prospering. They diminish our humanity. They preside over injustice, greed, and perversion, cruelty, and lust, and violence. It is possibly the most satanic dimension of their deceptive power that in spite of all this, they still persuade people that they are the beneficent predictors of their worshipers' identity, dignity, and prosperity, and must therefore be defended at all cost. Only the gospel can unmask these claims. And if you want to agitate someone, attack their idol. If you want to agitate someone, confront their idol. If you want to agitate a Christian who is in danger of creating an idol in their heart, touch that idol. And all of a sudden, you will see that carnal side that the Apostle Paul wrote about rise up. And that's why our 40 days of prayer and fasting are so important at Woodland that we do every year because we confront our own flesh, our own will, and we say to God, not my will, but thine be done in our lives. Because only the gospel of Jesus Christ can open our eyes to see these idols that creep into our lives. So I guess the first thing I would say about this is don't idolize anything. Don't idolize your family. Don't idolize your wife. Don't idolize your church. Don't idolize your finances. Don't idolize your reputation. Imagine for just a moment, if you would for me, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Can you imagine those shocking words? Now, Jesus, if we were to go back in time to when Christ was born, Jesus is only a few weeks old now. She's nursing this little baby at her breast. She's cuddling this little baby. They're they're poor. And all Mary has ever wanted to be, if I read the scriptures correctly, she's wanted to be and to have the reputation of a good girl. She married, she was engaged to be married to a good guy. He was known as righteous in all that he did. 
And all he ever wanted to do was to marry a girl that had a good reputation that he loved and that they could build a godly family together. And Mary knew the moment that the angel spoke to her and said that the child in you will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. She knew at that moment her reputation for being a good girl was out the window. She knew at that very moment tongues were going to wag. Who are going to believe this? Joseph certainly wouldn't believe it. And we know from the scriptures, Joseph didn't believe it until God showed up on the scene and spoke those true words to Joseph. And so for the rest of Mary's life and Joseph's life, and even Jesus grew up, there was, there's a couple of sneers in the, the gospels that help you to see that this ongoing lack of faith, people sneered at Jesus' birth. Mary lived with it and Joseph lived with it, but she chose not to idolize her reputation. Joseph chose not to idolize his reputation. And Mary said those powerful words, be it unto me according to thy word. That's a dangerous thing to say, ladies and gentlemen. That's a dangerous thing to say, brothers and sisters, because it takes faith in God to live out those words, be it unto me according to thy word. Be it unto me, Lord, whatever your will is in my life, whatever it costs, wherever you take me, but I refuse to idolize anything. It's why the scripture says in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 15, for your own good, then make certain you do not sin by making for yourself an idol of any form at all, Why does God say this? Because it's good for you and me not to have idols in our lives. Becky Pippert, who wrote that wonderful book that I've recommended so many times, Out of the Salt Shaker into the World, she wrote these words, Whatever controls us is our Lord. The person who seeks power is controlled by power. The person who seeks acceptance is controlled by the people or he or she wants to please. We do not control ourselves. We are controlled by the Lord of our life. If Jesus is our Lord, then he is the one who controls. He has the ultimate power. There are no bargains. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? It's why that song still means so much to me. Jesus, be the Lord of all. Jesus, be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of my heart. Because I tend to have these idol-making factories in my own life as well. You say, well, why would God say this? Well, quickly, number one, God is free. When people create idols, they're wanting to control God. They wanted to limit God. They want to somehow or another have power over God, and God is free. God is not human. God is not bodily. God is spirit. God created all of this. And when somebody creates an idol, then that idol is their attempt to control God and to possess God. Number two, God is jealous. We just looked at that. He's not going to share your affection with anybody else. And number three, our faith is different as Christians than any other faith. Our faith comes by hearing and not by seeing. Remember that verse where I ask you to circle the word spoke? You heard the voice. You heard the voice speaking to you. You did not see any bodily form. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the... I couldn't hear you. And hearing by the... I am not deaf. Let me hear it again. And hearing by the... Do you connect that? Faith is not by sight. Remember what I said a few moments ago on that very turbulent airplane ride when that pilot said, and we're bouncing all over the place, that pilot says, but we will get you there safely. My neighbor is a big, burly man, and he looks at me and goes, right. Glad to know I was the only one afraid. Nobody t- offered, asked for my man card. You know, it was, a, it was a turbulent flight. 
And yet this pilot was saying, trust me, we can't find smooth sailing. You don't know me, but I know what I'm doing. Friends, I know God. I know him through Jesus Christ, and he knows what he's doing. Somebody say amen this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> and then number four, God provides his own intercessor. God doesn't need an idol. God provided for us Jesus Christ. Those of you who joined us, 56 of you that joined us for intercessory prayer last night as we prayed together, we sought the Lord together, you were joining with Jesus because he's ever interceding for you and me. 1 John chapter 2, this is the, the book I ask you to read after church today. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin... We have an advocate or an intercessor who pleads our case before the Father. Read it with me. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Who's ever interceding for you and me? It's Jesus. So God provides his own. And then finally, God has provided his own icons. You see, as Christians, we don't have images that we worship. There's a professor that I recently had lunch with that wants to send some of his students to our church to be a part of a worship service and write a paper on our church. And, and he asked me, he says, would you be sure to explain all the different symbolism in your church? And I said, well, we don't have a lot of symbolism in our church. I said, we have a cross. And I said, you know, we'll be happy to explain the cross. And and I said, we take communion every Sunday. We'll be happy to explain that. But I said, we don't have images of saints. We don't have images of Mary. We don't have icons like you would find maybe in some Orthodox churches that they kiss and bow down to. And uh, then I explained why. You see, the Bible says God has provided his own icons. Do you know who those icons are? They're you and me. God created us in his image. Another word for that is icon. He stamped his image upon us. Look at this word. Look at this word from the book of Genesis with me. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image, <coughs> our icon. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. <coughs> Pardon me. They will reign over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image and in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Do you see the true order of the way things are supposed to be? God created us in his image so that we could reflect the glory of God. God created us in his image so that when people look at you, they can see what God is like. Ever how poorly I represent him, they still see the image of God in you and me. Today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I, I joined with Coach Harborough, who yesterday spoke at a pro-life rally saying, let the unborn be born. They're created in the image of God. Whenever you see a human being, you're seeing the image of God. And especially when you see a couple, a man and a woman who are committed to one another in Christ. I'm going to embarrass a couple of people. I don't mean to embarrass you, but Kim, Bill, would you stand up, please? They show you what God looks like. Now, keep standing. Would you two stand up? Chuck and Nanette, would you stand up? Now, don't they look so different from one another? And yet, Chuck and Nanette are revealing the image of God. Bob, Carrie, would you all stand up? They're revealing the image of God. You see, everywhere you go, you're, I, I could just keep on going, but you can be seated. What I want you to see, God doesn't need an idol. God created us to have fellowship with him. He created us in his image when we sin. He sent an intercessor who died for our sins at Calvary, who was raised from the third day. He is ever interceding for you and me that we can share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we go in the world. Can we not praise him for that this morning? Friends, I think that's utterly phenomenal that I get to represent the Lord to this world, and so do you. Number two then occasionally that means I need to walk up the mountain <coughs> because I'm an idol-making factory. I have this tendency. We all have these tendencies. 
And sometimes we need, like during our 40 days of prayer and fasting, we walk up the mountain and we say, Lord, I give you back this idol. Abraham and Sarah had a son, one of the most misunderstood stories in all of the Old Testament, had a son of promise. God gave them Isaac. And Abraham made an idol out of his son Isaac. He idolized his son. Some of the decisions he made were kind of questionable after Isaac was born, but it's because he had so much love and affection. And so God speaks to this man who loves him, who's having problems the way some of you and I have problems in our spiritual life sometime. And he says, I want you to take your son, your one and only son Isaac, and I want you to take him up the mountain, Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. Well, that just kind of blew Abraham's mind. God wasn't the one demanding human sacrifices. That was the other gods of this world. God, this goes against God's nature. This goes against God's character. So Abraham wrestled, and we can't imagine what he must have wrestled with God before. And finally, according to what the Bible tells us, and in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, Abraham finally reasoned if this is what God demands, then God must be going to raise Isaac from the dead because he's already made a promise. So Abraham goes up on the mountain, prepares to sacrifice his son, and God stops him and says, now I see that you love me with all your heart. You're not going to sacrifice your son. God provided a ram in his place, which was symbolic of Christ, the Lamb of God dying for us. Look at Genesis 22, verse 14. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. How many of you remember singing years ago, if you've been around that long, a little chorus called Jehovah Jireh, my provider? How many, a number of you remember that chorus. That's where it comes from. And so often people used it to talk about, oh, God's going to give me a Cadillac. God's going to give me a big house. No, God gave you a Savior. God gave you a Savior. And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll get our eyes off the Savior and we'll give our eyes upon these things in our lives that become idols. Well, let's wrap it up. And I want to talk to you about what worshiping God only will do in your life. And I want you to imagine a sailing regatta. We've got a couple of sailors in the church, <clears throat> and they can edit my remarks <clears throat> later if they need to. I've done some sailing with some of them. I have a friend down in the south that called me this week. He loves to sail, and I've been out with him on his boat. But let me tell you what worshiping God will do. And I want you to imagine a regatta. It's a, a regatta is a race. It's a boat race. If you've ever watched like the America's Cup or if you've ever watched those races off the coast of Australia, they're phenomenal. They're fun to watch. <clears throat> the team, as they work together, I want you to think about that as a church but as an individual as well. Number one, when I worship God only, God fills my sails. And I don't know about you. I don't want a slack sail. I don't want the sails of my life dropped I want a full sail. I want to live full steam ahead. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, he said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's why studying the Ten Commandments is so important. That's why studying the Word of God with your family and teaching your children and your grandchildren are so important. Christopher called me yesterday and and Becky taught <clears throat> Bear a little song when she would put him to bed at night while Bear was staying with us. And it was just simply called Always, Always, I'll Walk With Jesus Always. And they would sing it. And sometimes I'd join them as they were singing it. But Christopher and Rachel started singing it with him yesterday morning. He goes, no, that's a nighttime song. <laughs> that's a nighttime song. <laughs> and yet you can ask Bear, Bear, how long are you going to walk with Jesus? And he'll go, Always. But it's a nighttime song. I want you to know, sometimes in the darkest of nights, the best thing you can sing is I will follow Jesus always because he knows the way. He will keep your sails full. Can we give him another hand of praise? He will give you the energy. He will give you the power. He will be your source of life. He will be your inspiration. The second thing is he keeps my sails full. There is no power shortage in the Lord. 
Now, I'm only going off of what somebody told me from the news this week. I haven't read the story yet, but I chuckled when I heard it, and I wish it wasn't true. But during this cold, cold weather, in some parts of the country, according to the individual who called me to tell me this, People are having problems keeping their electric cars charged because it's too cold to charge their cars. I am so glad I do not own a $65,000 transportation machine that cannot be powered. Hello? I am so glad that I am not worshiping a log or an idol or a reptile or a fish or another man or a woman because God is able to keep my sails full through thick or thin, through good times or bad times, in sickness and health. God keeps us energized. Somebody say amen this morning. That's what he does. Take delight in the Lord, Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. In Romans 10, 11, the scripture says that no one who has faith will ever be disappointed. And I'm so grateful for the mercy of God that I'll talk about in the funeral next week. I'm so thankful for the thief on the cross. I'm so thankful for those that I prayed with who in those last moments of life have committed their lives to Jesus. I think of Tom, who worshiped with us for almost two years, gave his heart to Christ in my study one day, worshiped faithfully for almost two years, and then slipped into the presence of the Lord. I'm thinking of Henry, who came to church one Sunday morning and looked at me and stared at me real meanly, came to church. It was a businessman here in our community, came to my office, asked to come see me, came off and cussed me out. You know, I've told you before, you know, I don't get to hear a lot of people cuss, but I got to hear a lot of cussing that day. And Henry cussed me out, and I looked at Henry, and I said, Henry, it doesn't matter what you say. God loves you. I love you, and I'm going to pray for you, Henry, and you're not going to get away from that. And he slammed the door and walked out of my office, and a few days later, Henry was in the hospital. I took my oldest son, Andrew, with me. I said, Andrew, I want you to go with me to pray for an old cuss today. And we went to the hospital, and Henry gave his heart to Jesus, and Henry lived nine months for the Lord, passionately, got part of a small group, was a part of our church. I am grateful that whether you start young like I did, whether you start old like Henry or Tom did, or like the thief on the cross, God will cause you to finish this race. If you can stand the pulling, God will pull you through. Can you say amen to that this morning? I want to finish the race. There is a prize, just like at a regatta. There is a prize and there is a trophy. I want it not only for me, but I want it for Woodland Church as well. Can you imagine what God is going to do for us as a congregation when we finish this race together? Somebody say amen again. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful, and now the prize awaits me. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. How many of you want to finish the race? Can I see your hand? How many of you are looking forward to Jesus coming again? Can I see your hand? Friends, it's true, it's true, it's true. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning, and we're going to get ready to pray. I've mentioned our prayer, our 40 days of prayer several times today. A message is never completely finished. I'll tell you what happened every Sunday. After we have lunch, my family takes a nap and I'll sit up. I'll go back over my notes and I'll think of something else that could have been said or done. Sometimes on a Sunday morning I'll wake up and it's like something has just bubbled up in my spirit. And I thought, what if I lived a 40-day sequence <clears throat> all through the year? What if after 40 days of prayer, I chose 40 days to give something away every single day of my life for that 40 days? What would happen if for the next 40 days, I decided I'm going to give up meat for the next 40 days? 
And what I was doing is, what kind of little idols would that expose in my heart? And then I thought, oh, Jesus, please don't ask me to do this. This scared me. Matter of fact, I got out of bed and quit thinking about it when I thought of this one. What if God asked me to give up coffee for 40 days? You'd have to pray. How many of you were with me on that? I mean, yeah. But you see, that's the thing. Is I don't need a sequence of 40 days. I need to live every day like Jesus taught us to pray. Father, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. So I'm going to ask you just to bow your head for just a moment. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but Holy Spirit, I'm asking you because you love us. Starting with me, Lord, just search our hearts. We confess that we tend to be idol-making factories. And wherever we find one starting to grow in our life, Lord, we want to tear it down. We want to demolish it and destroy it. For, Lord, we worship only you. We worship only you. Father, we have no graven images in our lives or in our church. And Lord, we want your word to inform not only how we live, but how we worship. For you call us to be joyful, living sacrifices. Proving what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, while your heads are still bowed, I want you to recognize now how these idols wound you. How, as Chris Wright wrote in The Mission of God, they devour you, they steal from you, they devour your resources. And they lead you away. Now think about this. If God's put his finger on something in your heart, they lead you away from the image, the icon that God created you to be. Because what you worship is what you're going to become like. If you seek power, that's what you're going to become like. If you seek, if you worship whatever it is, that's what you're going to become like. And for the body of Christ to truly be the body of Christ, he has to be the Lord of all. So I ask the Lord right now to continue perfecting you in the image of Christ. And if you're with your husband or wife, take their hand and say, Lord, let Jesus be seen through our marriage. Let Jesus be seen through our, that's it. Just take your spouse's hand and hold it right now. God bless you. Jesus, let us be the image of God, expressing your love and your faithfulness, your goodness. <laughs> and then finally this morning, if God has put something on his, some, in your life, he's put his finger on something, then I want you to receive his grace. I want you to receive his mercy. I want you to receive his forgiveness for all those little idols and worship and love him. Oh, Jesus, be the Lord of all. Jesus, be the Lord of all. The kingdoms of our heart, the kingdoms of our mind, the kingdoms of our imagination. If you've never committed your heart to Jesus, it's not an accident that you're here. If you've wandered away from your faith, it's not an accident that you're here. It's not an accident that you're online. But the Holy Spirit is calling you to himself right now. 
Would you accept God's amazing offer of a new life, the forgiveness of sins that he provided for you at Calvary? And you can do that just simply by praying something like this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. And right now, Lord, I turn from any and all idols to following you with all my heart. As much as I know how, I commit myself to you today in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you did that, friends, something has happened in your life immediately. God is changing you, transforming you. You've been born again. If you pray that, let me know. If you're here in the sanctuary, nobody's looking around but me, but lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed with you. If you prayed online, let us know at the number they're going to give you on the screen or the website they're going to give you on the screen. Say, Pastor, I'm committing my life to Jesus Christ today. Well, let's give the Lord a hand of praise right now for his goodness and for his mercy. Let me send you home with this blessing today. I read to you earlier that God delights in blessing his people with peace, prosperity. They both mean the same thing. But would you take joy and would you receive the blessing of knowing that God delights in you? God rejoices over you. God sings over you. The Bible says that God dwells in the midst of the praises of his people. You and I have been made acceptable to Christ by his blood. Let's go forth and bless one another with the peace and the prosperity that God gives to us in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed this morning.